Dr Smith. Maybe a couple of seconds and I will. Debate is an important element of progress. Hi and welcome to our program, A View From Afar. Um, we're webcasting to you from Auckland City in New Zealand and from here tonight uh, we will take a look at some of the big issues that are confronting global politics um, at this week. Um, but first a little about what we are and who we are. Um, Evening Report uh, is an independent media outlet based here in New Zealand. Um, it is a member of the New Zealand Media Council and publishes reportage and analysis about global and regional current affairs. Uh, this program, A View From Afar, is a joint venture with Dr. Paul Buchanan's security assessments business, 36parallel.com. We plan to webcast live each week around this time, where we will tackle the big issues that are developing around the world. Also, if you've joined us via social media, you can interact with the live show by leaving comments and questions. Uh, the best of these will incl be included in the program. So let's take a look at uh, what we are going to cover tonight. So a view from afar tonight with Paul Buchanan. Um, the United States, a tipping point. Um, what's happening over the United States, particularly around Portland and other cities? Where is it tracking? Who and what is the problem? and what are the solutions. So let's get into our program and go straight to Paul Buchanan who's waiting there to talk to us now. Good evening, Paul. All right, so I'm glad to be here. Yeah, so um, you've been doing a lot of work and watching what is happening in the United States. So describe to us how you see the whole security situation as it's developing in Portland and in other state, uh, cities and states around the United States. Uh, well, in order to do that, I think that what we'll have to do is, is take a little step back uh, from the United States, put things in comparative perspective. And the way to do this is to think about authoritarianism and authoritarian tactics. And by that, what I mean is when authoritarians find themselves in a bit of strife, they resort to certain tried and true methodologies that we seeing in the United States, uh, which is very unfortunate because the United States is a sensibly liberal democracy. Uh, one of the tactics that are used by authoritarians is to incite violence in the city using irregular uh, militia-type folk dressed in civilian clothes or dressed as anarchists who uh, create mischief and mayhem. And that justifies the use of official repressive agent, be it the police, or in the case of Portland, Oregon, be it a paramilitary uh, forces drawn from the federal government. So you, you're mentioning there, Paul, you're mentioning authoritarian states, which is only a, a hair's breadth away from totalitarianism, isn't it? Um, so are you talking about the Trump administration here in the context of authoritarianism verging on totalitarianism? Uh, yeah, what I'm, what I'm basically pointing out, and others have done this as well, is that uh, Trump is resorting to authoritarian methods uh, to two things. One is to intimidate and quell the protests that originated with the death of George Floyd and have morphed into the Black Lives Movement and protests about the entire current tone of the Trump administration, but he's also trying to rally his base around a law and order ticket that there are rising crime rates in democratic-controlled cities and states. And this is where the authoritarian transparency is apparent, because uh, most of the, the protests in Portland, as in 90%, of civil disobedience in Portland has been peaceful. There have been episodes of violence, and I don't discount the fact that there may be some leftist-inspired violence. Provocateurs from both sides? Uh, yes. You know, with one, there's a whole uh, violent collective action logic 
uh, where opportunists, thieves and whatnot will jump in to a legitimate protest in order to take advantage of the situation. But here we got something more sinister. Does that justify the Trump administration's response? Absolutely not. And let me explain why this is an orchestrated, uh, if you will, escalation that doesn't have a bearing in fact. Uh, the Portland is well known for having white supremacists and right-wing extremists in its midst. It's also a very liberal city. I mean, it's, it's got a schizophrenic character, yeah, if you will. Well, well known for that liberal uh, population, yeah. We tend to know more about the liberal side, but uh, let's be very clear. Portland has a very active white supremacist movement within it, and uh, it is suspected uh, that uh, there are elements within the police forces who share sympathies with some of these right-wing groups. And what appears to be happening, which has also happened in other cities, is that members of these white ring, ring, white, ring uh, white extremist groups have infiltrated the protest movement, and they are provoking. They are uh, the ones who are committing the acts of violence, and then they run. So they throw rocks, they throw Molotovs at uh, public buildings, uh, they damage private property, and then they take off. And the peaceful protesters are left to take the brunt of the police response. So we've seen that in some of the video that's playing um, as, as we are discussing this. Um, you can see um, people getting caught up in that, uh, exactly what you're describing. Um, there's a case that has become quite prominent in the United States media where, a, you know, a former, he's a military vet, um, former Navy um, uh, um, officer, as I believe, and he is basically getting beaten with, with, with batons, paper sprayed right in his face, and he turns around and gives him the finger. So this is the whole thing, isn't it? You know, that it's actually taking off into areas where there is peaceful people legitimately protesting, which is their democratic right. Is that fair to say? Exactly. And this is where I have to go back to the authoritarian question. Because the dictatorships that I mentioned, again, both the left and the right, uh, what they do is they'll put, put these agent provocateurs into an otherwise peaceful crowd and then use the violence of these agent provocateurs to justify the use of state repression on the peaceful protesters. Uh, you know, again, it's a tactic used by authoritarians. And that way they can say that they're, uh, you know, they're adhering to law and order. They're getting rid of these violent protesters and that sort of thing, when in fact it's all orchestrated. And they're orchestrated for what is, what, what, what is uh, U.S. President Donald Trump's end game here? Well, the short term is to delegitimate the legitimate peaceful protesters. So we have to remember that the provocateurs, the police, and now these federal paramilitaries that Trump has sent into Portland are working hand in glove. Two of the three in this equation have official sanction. The third, the right-wing extremists posing as Antifa or whatever they're doing, uh, they melt back into the shadows, but they're serving the same purpose, which is to discredit, delegitimate the BLM movement and justify the use of force in other democratic controlled cities. And it's interesting because so Trump this, is doing this, this is partisan then. You're saying democratically um, controlled cities. The governor, for example, uh, in Oregon is a Democrat, yeah? Yes. And, and she has come out, um, I think there's a clip going to be playing now. Here she is on screen at the moment. And she's speaking exactly to the point that you've raised here. Um, where she is saying there's, they just arrived, we have no warning, um, they're making it worse, they're inciting violence. Um, we have this under control, we had it under control, and they must just get out. I'm paraphrasing here, of course, but that's the general message from here. Is that how you see it, too? Uh, yes. Let's, let's understand that the federal government does have a constitutional right to send in federal forces to defend uh, federal buildings, federal installations, I mean, the post office, for example, and certainly federal courts. They have the right to do that. They do not have a right to engage in crowd control outside of the immediate vicinity of the sites that they're ostensibly protecting. And these federal forces in, in Portland are roaming uh, blocks away mm. from the places they're supposedly defending. But there's also a more important point, 
which is when federal forces are deployed to supposedly supplement local law enforcement, they do so at the request of the local authorities with the consent of the local authorities, and none of that is happening here. So we hear what she says about that. I, I think it's around at this point where uh, the governor is talking about it. in public safety, they would be willing to de-escalate and engage in dialogue. Instead, they bring more troops to the streets. Uh, they take uh, peaceful protesters off uh, into unmarked cars. And unfortunately, last weekend, they almost killed a peaceful protester. This is absolutely outrageous. It is a violation of the principles on which this country was founded. So what we're seeing there is um, clearly um, underscoring what you're talking about here. I um, mean, she is saying it's just getting worse. Um, it's not going to be getting better when you've got this outside control and certainly by, as you say here, paramilitary troops. So, so where is the Constitution in this, Paul? Well, again, the Constitution is, uh, is being violated here, uh, in fact, if not in principle. Um, what the White House is ordering, and I should point out that this is the executive branch alone. Uh, the other two branches of government are not involved in sending, sending these federal paramilitaries. And I, I, just to tell you a little bit about the character of these federal forces, because it shows you the insidious and sinister nature of Trump's ploy. Uh, these federal forces are not military forces. Uh, they are brought from the Border Patrol. Uh, they are brought from ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the guys who pull people out of their homes and detain them prior to deportation. Uh, They're brought from the Drug Enforcement Agency. These agencies are all notorious for their anti-immigrant racist views, and their unions are controlled by Trump supporters. So they have become very partisan agencies of the executive branch, and they are housed under the jurisdiction of the Department of Homeland Security, which is one of the most politicized of so, the federal agencies. So we've been They're talking. drawn from outside of Oregon. There's no Oregonians hmm. amongst these federal paramilitaries. And that's by design. And they're brought into repeat, Portland repeat. as if they were an occupying force. They view the locals as aliens. They look, view the locals as hostile. And this, again, is a tried and true authoritarian tactic I'll give you a parallel. The Chinese, when they send their military police forces to Hong Kong, and they've ringed Hong Kong with these forces, these people are brought from the interior of China, from provinces in China. They have no notion of what Hong Kong's about, and they are told that the Hong Kongese are spoiled, they're decadent, they're treasonous, and they deserve to be punished for their treason against the motherland. Well, here they may not go to such extremes to indoctrinate these federal forces, but the thrust is the same. You bring them in to what they consider an alien environment that is extremely hostile to their presence, and you expect trouble to occur, and in fact you go looking for trouble, as we've seen in, in videos where these federal Forces have moved into the streets and arrested people and then, unbelievably, thrown them into unmarked vans. And here's where the sinister level goes, you know, it goes extremely high. If it was, I if to it have was China, a, a if background it, that included yeah, uh, childhood say, and adolescence and young uh, adulthood just being back, raised back in Argentina just, just on and point. other southern cone countries during the dictatorships yeah. of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And in Argentina in particular, one of the methods the military dictatorship used was to have men in gray suits cruise around in unmarked Ford Falcons, green Ford Falcons, to make the point. And they would take people off the streets, and those people would never be seen again. Now, in the United States or in Portland, it appears these people that are picked up in these unmarked vans are later dumped on the outskirts of Portland and they are not harmed, but the effect is one of degree. It's an intimidation of innocent people for political purposes on the part of the U.S. executive branch against the will and the consent of the governor and the mayor 
of Portland, the governor of Oregon and Portland. And now Trump is threatening to repeat the whole exercise in Chicago. I was just going to say that he made claims this earlier this week that New York, Chicago, that they're controlled by Democrats, that he, according to Trump, they're not doing a good job and he's going to send them in. Now, we see them ratcheting up overnight, um, you know, the, the, the attention on Chicago. One of the points I was going to bring in here is a comparative element of which you did. You brought in to the, um, the Latin American, South American kind of elements of comparison there. If this in right now was occurring in Hong Kong to this degree, as in part and to a degree, by degrees, we've seen the situation over in Hong Kong uh, de uh, escalating into chaos uh, in the last few months. The world has been shocked and horrified. Is the world, this program's called A View From Afar, should we be concerned, should we be horrified, and should our governments be standing up, unified and saying enough is enough, you are a part of the international community, we do not support this type of federal governance? Well, unfortunately, the geopolitical moment is not opportune for such a move, and I'll tell you why. For the first time in three decades, we have more authoritarian governed states in the international community than we have democracies. Uh, after years, decades of democratization, there's been a reversal over the last 10 years. Now, a lot of these dictators are elected into office and very much like the Nazis in Europe, then withdraw the democratic liberties once they've been elected, claiming that they're legitimate and they represent the will of the people. And there's many, 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 many uh, authoritarians of this sort. Erdogan in Turkey is a classic example. Duterte in the Philippines is another. Uh, Victor Urban in Hungary is yet another. Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil is certainly headed down that path. Uh, so they get elected in, and then they close shop behind them. They close the door behind them. The United States is on that spectrum. The United States has a leader who clearly doesn't understand uh, constitutional niceties, uh, sees it as a document that, if not deserving to be trampled, uh, deserves to be manipulated in his partisan interests, which gets me back to what's going on in the United States today. And what's going on is Trump is uh, on his way to losing an election if it's held, held uh, fairly. And so he's doing two things. Uh, you will have noticed that in the past few days, he all of a sudden has embraced all the pandemic advice that he rejected for four months up until this week. Hmm. Wear masks, uh, social distance, all that sort of stuff. You know why that is? Because the worst outbreaks now are in the very states where his base is located, hmm. in those very red states in the South and in the Midwest. They are now engulfed in that pandemic because they followed his skepticism. They followed his lead when it came to the early treatment of the pandemic and the blue states on both coasts, which ignored his, uh, you know, his admonitions not to wear masks and to go about your life. They're doing a lot better. So Trump, on the one hand, now that his base is being literally infected by this disease, he's all of a sudden discovered science and discovered that we need to have, you know, proper medical procedures for those folks. On the other hand, in the blue states, he's using these paramilitary forces under the justification that there's rising crime in these cities that is perpetrated by left-wing agitators, Antifa, and others associated with the Democratic Party, none of which is true, but will certainly rally his base. And I think that the bottom line is he wants to double down hmm. on the strategy in 2016, which is he doesn't need 50% of the vote to become president. He only needs 30%. The Democrats will then uh, eat themselves alive arguing about identity politics. And so if he can cultivate that 30%, let's call it to be polite, law and order base, uh, I happen to think it's a lot more than that, but let's call them the law uh, and order uh, base then it is possible that if the Democrats do, in fact, set to quarreling, let's say, for example, the left wing of the Democratic Party is not happy with Joe Biden for whatever reasons that they decide to sit out the election 
as punishment to the moderate Democrats or the corporate Democrats, then he stands a chance of winning. And so what we see is, you know, the carrot is him embracing science for the red states now that the pandemic has struck them, and the stick for the blue states, because they've defied his orders all along, and quite frankly, they're exercising their constitutionally guaranteed rights to peaceful protests, uh, except for the fact that they've now been infiltrated by these right-wing agitators. Okay, so hold that thought. We'll just take a few seconds break and get back to discuss what are the solutions here? What is the way forward? Okay? Sure. So welcome back, everybody. Um, so, Paul, what what is the solutions that are there as you see them, both constitutionally and on the ground, to Portland, potentially Chicago, and potentially New York City? Well, the good news is that the first solutions are already being offered, and what they are is court challenges to Trump's executive orders. Uh, they're both in Oregon, uh, in Illinois, uh, New York is already levied. Uh, preemptive case. And then we have agencies like uh, the ACLU, uh, the American Civil Liberties Union, which have all enjoined lawsuits against the uh, unlawful use or unconstitutional use of uh, federal forces for local law enforcement and crowd control. And uh, just regarding the fact that these, uh, these paramilitaries that we've been talking about are not trained in riot control. They're not trained uh, in crowd control, and again, they have no jurisdiction outside the immediate vicinity of the public uh, buildings and whatnot that they're ostensibly charged with protecting. So I think those lawsuits uh, have merit, and I think that they will be successful. The question is, will the Trump administration pay any heed to any court order that prohibits them from, uh, from deploying these sort of troops uh, in the streets of cities like Chicago? Uh, Boston, uh, and New York. And so that, that sounds like a situation where, under your assessment, Trump has gone beyond the Rubicon, as they say. He's crossed the line. The tipping point ha 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 has been established. And there, what, what solutions are there for Trump should he want to retreat back? We've seen him, for example, in geopolitics around the world, particularly with respect to Asia, where he'll push a hard line and then he'll retreat back. Do you see that he can do this now, or is the public in a situation where it's thinking, ah, no, we're over this, and there's no way back for Trump? Well, he's lost a very significant institutional constituency, and that is the U.S. military. When he performed that stunt of clearing Lafayette Park with rubber bullets and tear gas, so that he could stage that photo op holding a Bible in front of uh, I believe it's called St. John's uh, Church on the other side of Lafayette uh, Square from uh, the White House. And when he used Secretary of Defense Esper and Joint uh, 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 Staff Chairman Mike Miley as props in that stunt, he lost the military leadership because that was a supreme violation of civil military relations in a democracy. The military is not supposed to be politicized, and they resented that. In fact, it was surprising that Miley held on to his job. Hmm. And my understanding is that uh, the chairman, uh, the other the other generals on the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff were extremely unhappy with him and, it, and, read, him, and read him the riot act about uh, how he got used. Well, Including Colin Powell, Republican, military general, former. Uh, oh, absolutely yeah. called the, the troops to line, really, uh, from what it looked like from way across the Pacific where we're located. Oh, former Secretary of, uh, of Defense Jim Mattis, the immediate predecessor to Esper, denounced the move. But what's important for this discussion today is that the military is not going to have a bar of any of this sort of stuff. Now, it does go back to the question, if, if Trump ignores court orders to cease and desist with the deployment of these federal agents in what is clearly a partisan move, then what is the solution set? Well, one, 
which I hope we'll never have to go to, is that the governors of the state in question call out their respective national guards uh, against these federal forces. Now, that, that could bring like the a, right a, line. That, that? That, that could end up, well, let, let's just cut to the chase here. That could end up like a civil war type situation, wouldn't it? It could. It would be a microcosmic civil war. But think of it this way. And this is not beyond the pale anymore. If uh, the National Guard is called out, let's say in a place uh, such as Oregon. So the Oregon National Guard is called out. And uh, the, the governor would say to the Trump administration, uh, thanks, uh, you've had your time here. We can take over now with our National Guard, who are Oregonians. And, um, you know, good luck. Uh, uh, we wish you well on your way back to Washington or wherever your headquarters are. If these forces refuse to leave, then it sets the stage for an armed confrontation between them and the Oregon National Guard, to which can be added these right-wing militias. I can't emphasize enough that the right-wing militias operate with the knowledge of the police and of these federal forces. You know, they work hand in glove. Uh, it's a tried and true tactic, as I've said. And so we then have the, the setting the stage of what could be at least an interstate war. Now, I, I, I don't think it's going to get to that. I think that uh, not only will the U.S. military, uh, to which the National Guards have pledged, will come in on the side of the governors and say, you know, we're, we're behind the National Guard. We're not, no, we're not behind these irregular federal forces. But I also think that entities like Congress, even with all of the Republican obfuscation and enablement of Trump, will see that this is finally a line that should not be crossed. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit sanguine about the prospects that reason will prevail and the governors will get to regain control over the security situation in their, uh, their cities. Uh, but you never know what Trump's going to do when he gets desperate. His only interest at this point is to win the election, and perhaps if he doesn't win it, oh, cool. to somehow come on to power claiming that there's a national emer emergency or and the vote can't be held. Or call uh, it off. Due or call it off. So It'll be hard for him to call it off, but he, he certainly can rig it. Let's think of the voter suppression efforts. Uh, there are things on the table now that are outrageous to include uh, bankrupting the U.S. Postal Service, privatizing it or leaving it in bankruptcy so that it ceases operations. Well, absentee ballots are sent by snail mail. Hmm. They're physical ballots. I, I, in fact, have one here. I'm an absentee uh, uh, voter in Palm Beach County, Florida. And I have my ballot sitting on my desk for the primary in August. If he is able to do this, and he has some support in Congress to do it, then most absentee ballots will never reach their, the voters at all. That's one way to suppress it. He can also claim uh, that with the pandemic ongoing, with the riots in the streets, as he claims, that the situation is one of a national emergency, and under his executive authority, he can declare a national emergency and suspend the elections for the foreseeable future. That's normally only done in wartime, in dire circumstances. But for Trump, given his vision of the world, the most dire of circumstances is the fact that he's going to get booted out of power. And so he's liable to do that. The question is, will the Republicans uh, put up with this? Will they not understand that if Trump goes down this path, he'll be destroying the Republican Party along with his presidency? And it leaves a legacy for others to follow that, quite frankly, we really don't want if we want to see the United States remain as a liberal democracy or now. Uh, I would call the United States today uh, what the transitions and the, the comparative politics literature calls a hard democracy. In closing, Paul, in closing, 
what would your suggestion be to those that want to express their legitimate right to protest? The mothers out there, you've got people who work in the hospitals, people who are concerned, you've got obviously those from, from the academic world, um, you've got others from the unions, you've got others for representing ordinary people that are trying to get ahead. What's your advice to them considering the security situation that they find themselves in at the moment? Well, what I would say is that they have to adopt uh, yet another tactic from abroad, which is called the United Front. And the United Front approach is you put aside your particular differences because you're facing a clear and present danger, a common threat in the person of Donald J. Trump. And so you hit the streets in numbers that these federal paramilitaries cannot control. Uh, but you do so peacefully. You do so with militancy and regularity. You make it sustainable over the long term. And you continue well into October, again, peacefully. Because then the overreaction that will come from the federal forces, and it will come, will seem disproportionate to the vast majority of Americans in an election year in particular, to whatever it is you're protesting about. And so long as we can get a mass of people, so everything from middle class moms to university professors to high school students, and get them on the streets clamoring for change. I mean, at this point, you can start focusing your sights on Trump's removal from office via the ballot box. And so if you phrase your protest as a defense of voting rights, as defense of that democratic privilege that is to vote freely and fairly, then I think the solution will not only be the removal of Trump from office and a restoration of something akin to normal, normalcy, uh, but a reaffirmation that in their hearts of hearts, the majority of Americans are uh, fair-minded people. Thank you, Paul. Much appreciated. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us for the first episode of A View From Afar. Um, look forward to bringing this to you again around about this time next week, um, and it'll be a weekly show. So once again, stay safe, and I hope uh, your week ends up being the best it possibly can.